Hi, we're live. Hi, this is Julie. And JP, Book of Hours. Uh, we're doing a live uh, uh, podcast uh, on Facebook Live. Uh, we'll be archiving this later on, on YouTube. Um, so what are we doing today? So we're talking a little bit about uh, the play Eclipsed that is playing here in San Francisco. Uh, it's, uh, if you want to talk a, bit, a little bit about mm -hmm. the, the, the content of the play and, of course, the historical background okay. of Liberia. So Eclipse takes place in the second uh, civil war of Liberia, the country of Liberia. And um, for those of you uh, who are in their teens, um, it took place before you were born. Um, the history of Liberia, basically, uh, if you don't know anything about Liberia, you can go to the link on the Wikipedia page that we'll, we'll pr provide. Um, Liberia was a, a colony uh, in West Africa uh, that was colonized by um, West, uh, sorry, um, freed American uh, slaves as well as freeborn uh, American, uh, African Americans. It was um, brought about by a society in America by um, slaveholders and politicians in 1816 who wanted uh, free uh, slaves and um, free blacks to move out of America. They just didn't want them around. So it was an opportunity for them to go home to their home country. And Lincoln supported this. Yeah, so Lincoln uh, was one of them. Abraham Lincoln, James Monroe, and others uh, were, were part of this organization called the American Colonization Society. Um, in eight, by 1822, they started sending people over. By 1847, uh, Liberia actually declared its own independence uh, from America and from, you know, in the world. Uh, United States didn't recognize that independence until 1862 when they were in the middle of our, our own civil war. Mm -hmm. um, and then by, uh, yeah, so by 1862 they, they recognized this. Now, fast forward to 1980, um, we had our first coup uh, of a legitimate, legitimately elected president um, uh, by uh, uh, Samuel Doe. Uh, Samuel Doe was later usurped by Charles Taylor in 1989, I think it is. And um, Charles Taylor is the president uh, who's being uh, fought against in a second civil war uh, during the time uh, this play takes place, Eclipsed. So we fast forward to 2003 and we're dropped in the middle of a compound in a warlord's uh, camp. Right. And so the story is about four girls who... Uh, had been kidnapped, their parents were slaughtered, and they had been kidnapped um, to be this one particular warlord's um, uh, slaves, uh, slaves, sex slaves. Harem, they yeah. were sex slaves. They were called wives. Um, but but they were really just sex slaves. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's four different types of girl. One is really funny, um, and she sort of makes the whole compound, you know, the four women, she sort of acts as the. Uh, she brings them together. You know, mm -hmm. she's really funny. She's always cracking jokes. Um, the other one is the only one who knows how to read. Uh, so she has book learning. And the other one has been there the longest, who uh, is considered a number one, like wife number wife one. Wife number one, yeah. And then there's the fourth one is one that doesn't actually live in the compound. She left the compound, decided she did not want to be a sex slave or a wife. And... Um, took up a gun and, and joined the rebel forces. Yeah, as a soldier. As a soldier. Right. So, rather than talk about the play itself, um, I want to talk about, you know, my reaction or, or my witnessing the reaction that some of the audience members had to certain, um, to, to certain uh, uh, scenes that were in the play. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, so over the last few days, uh, we've had students coming in to watch the plays. This was part of their... Uh, you want to fill in the fact that we're, we're ushers there? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we work at... At the theater. <laughs> we work at the theater. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I also want to talk about our positions there and um, what that means to us as working there. I'm going to talk about the union and all okay. that. So, all right, cool. But before I go into that, I want to talk about how the students that came in on the first day, so the first batch of students that came in came in from about 10 schools. There were about 1,300 students total, and they're from public schools? Yeah, they were all San Francisco and Bay Area public schools. Right, so through the San Francisco Unified School District, yeah. uh -huh. uh, public schools. So these are kids that are in public school. And then on the second day, when we had our student um, 
a field trip. Uh, they were all uh, private schools. They were uh, like Catholic, Catholic schools, schools and some charter some schools. Some charter schools. Right. And, uh, yeah. And so there is a scene in the play where the one of the wives that left the, the camp and became a, um, a rebel soldier, uh, where she comes back and she tries to convince, you know, uh, one... The, the newest the wife. The newest wife uh, to, to join her. And the, the first wife is basically saying, no, 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 don't do this. This is bad. You don't know what these rebel soldiers, what they're really about. And uh, then... The, the wife that holds the gun is like, look, this is the only way that I can get, you know... What I want. Th- what I want, and this is how I protect myself from being raped. Um, and she holds the gun. And the first set of students that came in from the public school erupted in applause. They brought the house down. Yeah. They screamed, they yelled, they clapped, they cheered. Well, they they and the really line. identified with... That, True. you know, with yeah. holding the gun to get what you want. And that terrorized me. Yeah. Well, the line, and I think the line too was, was, was I don't, people don't fuck with me when I have a gun. Right. Something like that. Right. And so that, you know, the, the combination of the language, the usage of, of the expletive, you know, in re- reference to the gun and the, and the intent behind that statement, I think, is what really resonated with the audience. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That, um... So, so and I, I agree with you. I, I I was like, holy fuck. I was just because we're you know we're we're anti-war and we're anti-gun. We're you know we we understand the 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 political machinations that are behind the wars and behind the gun industry. So we look at it from a historical level. We look at it from a capital capitalist uh, position. We understand that the money involved that creates this, and we understand that it creates division. In the citizenry, mm-hmm. and that's you know, and that's another thing I want to touch on. But before I do that, I want to talk about the second set of students who came in—the students that were from the Catholic schools and the private schools, and also the charter schools. When that scene came up, those students had no reaction. No. So I was not like, much. It was a very so little reaction. I had to walk away from those two experiences and really think about what that meant to me personally the first thing that I felt was complete disgust with the first set of students' uh, reaction to cheer and say that's right I have a gun I can get what I want and no one's going to fuck with me Um, but then I realized that their place where they come from whatever you know whatever political ideology that they grow up in Whatever uh, environment that they live in, it perpetuates uh, violence. It perpetu- you know, maybe they come from violent homes or, or they have, you know, the media surrounding them that's always talking about violence. And oftentimes, you know, they might see something on the news where somebody gets killed and, and they might say to themselves, you know what, if that person had had a gun, he could have protected mm-hmm. himself and he could be alive today. And that other guy who tried to kill him would be dead. Right. So violence... Well, you have a, com- you know, a combination of, of local news media that, that, that is always talking about death and violence and murder right. and, and what, you know, havoc takes place in a city, in an urban city, setting or whatever, suburbs... Um, you have uh, uh, cons- consuming um, of um, you know uh, popular culture, whether it's you know video games, um, music, uh, popular music, um, all these all these contemporary um, popular uh, um, culture um, entities. Uh, you know they tend to uh, glorify violence, especially video games, especially hip hop yeah. culture, especially. I mean, not all hip hop culture. I'm no, not, not know, all. You know, of but you not. you have yeah. that element, and it's very prominent. Right. Um, and and uh, and then the news media, you know, all feeding in, and and they don't have as many filters. Maybe what I saw took away from what you just talked about was is that the second set of kids in the private schools, they were more middle class, they were more privileged, and they were more uh, focused on uh, book learning and and you know staying you know studying because they want to get into college and stuff like that because of their, their the background of their families. Right. Okay. Whereas so, the first set of kids, right. it, that that culture isn't even in the schools. You know, right. That, that idea. So um, that the the mayhem may take place in the schools as much as, as it it's, does outside. Exactly. Right? So that's why so many people are are supporting Betsy DeVos's idea of charter schools um, because you know 
I suppose I can see why people would want that. You know, mm-hmm. public schools, there's there's a lot of violence. There's not enough funding, so they don't get the, the opportunity that some of the kids whose parents can afford to send them to private schools have. So the two completely diametrically opposed reactions to that one scene was very, very uh, telling to me. Um, so we... Um, so, you know... And on a more sort of political or social uh, level, I want to sort of, you know, route this into what's happening with this in our country. So we've got, you know, figureheads on a federal level, like Nancy Pelosi uh, and Chuck Schumer and Keith Ellison, who was, you know, supposed to be the the Democratic chair, but it's uh, Tom Perez instead. Uh, you know, and plus we have everybody, everybody on the Republican side that is basically saying that, you know, it's time to go to war. There is not one person in, even Bernie Sanders is, is promoting war, war, basically war, war with Syria, war with Russia, right. war with Iran. And, and exploiting this false narrative of the, the Russian hacks and right. things of that nature. So one of the things that happens when you have, you know, pretty much everyone in unison saying, you know, we're going to go... And, and have this, you know, war overseas, is you have the citizenry that is fractured. You've got one side saying, you know, no way, no war, I'm against this. And you've got the other side saying, yeah, we got to go to war, we got to protect the country, we got to, you know, intervene in these, you know, corrupt democracies and, you know, bring American <laughs> bring democracy <laughs> across the world yeah. because we saw how well that worked out in Syria. So... The, the point is, is that's that... They, you know, that's what they say they're doing. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the point is, is that they create this narrative so that they can not only perpetuate these large global-scale wars, but also to, to feed into that civil war rhetoric. You know, every time we get a new president uh, or we get a new uh, um, administration... Uh, California threatens to to secede from the rest it seems of the country. Like it. It, seems like it. it happens all the time, and so and, and that is a rhetoric that is that is promoted, and it's it's you get it on a feedback loop with mainstream media. All of your friends talk about it. Everybody else talks about it, uh, and it creates division within the citizenry. So then you've got you know you've got the the beginning stages of civil war. Um, that is meant to distract you from the larger issue, the larger, more repressive and oppressive economic uh, fallout from these global global scale wars. Um, and I can guarantee you, if we do, you know, end up going into another global intervention type war, we are definitely going to see more and more and more of this civil war type rhetoric, um, and it's going to keep the country divided. Uh, because so division, that they can keep doing what they want to do. Exactly, so that they can keep doing what they want to do. And division is weak. Division creates weakness. Mm-hmm. One of the things that you can see an example of how when everybody comes together, how it creates strength and it pushes your administration to do the right thing is something that uh, actually Ralph Nader and Bernie Sanders kind of touched on a little bit, um, is the uh, the policy of, uh, of uh, our health issue or, you know, the Affordable Care Act and uh, single payer or Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. Um, So we've got 60% or more of the population that are, that are for uh, uh, the, or they're for for single single payer payer. and Medicare for all. Uh, And, and they're wondering why Bernie Sanders is going around and saying, you know, let's keep the Affordable Care Act intact. Even though he campaigned on... Even though he campaigned in the primaries right, so on Medicare for All. Yeah. Remember, every other modern nation has, you know, free health care. Why are we the only modern nation that doesn't, you know, that? remember all that those speeches? Mm-hmm. So the point is, um, is, is that is a very good example about how you can, you can push the administration uh, to, to the correct... A response to what the American people want because we have so many Republicans, uh, we have a, a, you know millions of Republicans, millions of progressives, millions of Democrats, libertarians, d- democratic socialists, communists. All of us agree on one thing: we agree that yes, we are a modern nation, and if every other modern nation has 
single payer health care or Medicare for all, then so should we. And we all are in agreement on that. Yeah. So go ahead. The Finish figureheads are in place to keep the rhetoric to keep us divided. Nancy right. Pelosi never talks about single payer health care. No. She only talks about the Affordable Care Act. They but in the back channels, be right behind her, we've got over 60% of the population that are all in unison, that are all in agreement. That goes for, from Republicans to Democrats. That's everybody in agreement. So, so but, you know, in the back channels, as you said, it's like Pelosi is actually uh, downplaying it. She doesn't want the junior members of the Democratic Party bringing it up and talking about it because mm -hmm. they want two things. They want to play up the whole uh, rhetoric of, of the ACA, be, or is it, what is it, the American Care Act? Yeah, the Affordable, Affordable Care, Care Act. Care Act mm -hmm. Being, you know, uh, uh, attacked by the evil Republicans. Okay, so right. that's one narrative. And the other one is is that, you know, she's a, she's a stooge of the big state, or the deep state. So right. she, they, they don't want that, right? They don't want single payer. They don't want to give, to give us that. They want right. us to be poor and divided. But here's where people are starting to come together in unison, right. in town hall meetings. What was that example? The guy in, in uh, where was that, Arkansas? I think it was Arkansas. There was uh, a... There Representative was a, Cotton? Yeah, was it Cotton? Some, something like that. Yeah. And, and, and he, went to a, <laughs> he went to a town hall. And you've probably seen this video. And, and it's, it's, in, it's featured in the, uh, the Democracy Now! Um, uh, video that I posted earlier. But, um, so look for that. But... Yeah. <laughs> Cotton is like talking to his audience and, and, and he says something about, you know, you know, how we can't afford, you know, Affordable Care Act or he's, he's saying the opposite of what people want and they're just booing him and screaming at him and, and saying all these things. And so this opposition that they're trying or this, this, this divide that they're trying to create, uh, you know, between the de Democrats and Republicans is failing. This is something you pointed out to right. me earlier. Right. It's failing because people are coming together in these town halls against their politicians who are basically supporting policies that are against the American people and they're saying, screw you. Right. We don't believe one word that you're saying right. and you better get on board with what we want or you're out of here. So, and that's the where we have the power. Exactly. So where? So how does this apply? How does this uh, Applied to the play Eclipse. Okay, so, so uh, you know, for one thing, you know, you can you hear the rhetoric coming out of, um, and it's and it's it's um, it's not just rhetoric. I mean, it's it's um, um, uh, what is the word I'm thinking of? Um, ideological rhetoric. Okay, and it's basically the one the uh, wife number two, who's the soldier, is trying to get wife number four who's, you know, being recruited as a soldier to, to, re to recite the, uh, the party line. We are here to, to take out Charles Taylor, the monkey who has done these things, and we are going to do this to him and that to him, and then we're going to free, you know, Liberia. Right. Okay, so that kind of rhetoric that is the party line rhetoric is, is fed to you over and over and over again. Right. In our case, in the media, okay, so we're constantly being fed the false narrative of, of Russia being our enemy and that they're behind the, 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 uh, the election fraud or the election hacking, whatever, the fraud. Um, and that, um, that um, um, Syria is a failed state that we need to go in and take over and that, you know, we need to fight Russia on this as well. So all these, these, these false narratives that keep getting pushed at you through the media is very similar to what I saw in the rhetoric coming at the soldiers from the, uh, the, the rebels. Right. And what was your take? Yeah, on? and so, and exactly that, exactly that. So it's psychological conditioning. It's um, a little bit about what I talked about yesterday with the Milgram experiment, you know, where you, you are told that you have to do this and that you have to hurt the people mm -hmm. in order, you know, for the, for the bigger, better uh, um, uh, cause, you mm -hmm. know, which in Liberia's case was to be a free nation again, right, correct? But, but they were going in, the rebel soldiers were going into villages... And killing people, exactly. rounding up the children, the boys become soldiers and the girls become sex slaves. And right. we're talking, you know, 12 year old right. girls. So I guess the warning here oh, and the lesson that we can take away from, from Liberia and many other lessons that we can take away from many other uh, global interventionist proxy wars is that once you have uh, had a, uh, another country 
come in and try to take over another country, you get the, the, the rebel factions within the country that's being attacked, and you have a civil war. Mm -hmm. So it is... It, all we have to do, all we have to do, is look at history. All we have to do is is open up a, you know, a book on war, and we can see mm -hmm. that if we continue down this path where we antagonize Iran, and we antagonize Russia and P and Putin and Assad, then these types of experiences will happen in our own country, mm -hmm. and we will be a we will have rebel factions within our own country, and we will be broken up as a nation. We must come together as a nation, and I think we've, come, we, we've shown that we can come together as a nation uh, through the example of uh, universal health care or single-payer health care. We are all in agreement. Most of the country is in agreement, and I, I think that, you know, Ralph Nader said 60%, but I honestly think it's more like, you know, maybe 70-80% of us can come together as a nation and we all are in agreement about this one issue. Now what other issues can we come together as a nation mm -hmm. on? Yeah. Why is, has Donald Trump just, you know, given $54 billion to, to, you know, the war efforts or to the military, but he has completely dismantled the Environmental Protection Agency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that affects all of us. You know, the environment right. is everywhere, and, and so the reason that we have clean air, we don't have acid rain anymore. This is something that I grew up with, acid rain, you know, this concept of acid rain. Uh, the concept of, like, dirty air, uh, trash and, and pollutants everywhere, clean right. water. We have clean water in, you know, rivers that, you know, there's, there's wildlife coming back to rivers now that um, weren't there for, like, you know, 80 years Okay, and it's only now that they're starting to come back, and that's because of 45 years of Environmental Protection Agency. So, I, 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 you know, to bring it back to, to how this is sort of a, we're looking at this from, you know, we're, we're sort of armchair social anthropologists over here, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I, sometimes I become a, an armchair psychologist, and I've been, you know, criticized for that, because, you know, I don't have any official training. But the point is, is that you, you continue to allow yourself to be conditioned by the media in the same way that this girl that had watched her family slaughtered right before her eyes on her home country by someone who is from her country mm -hmm. and then was, you know, was brought in to be a sex slave was being conditioned to, to go do the same, mm -hmm. to do exactly the same, all in the, in the fake uh, rhetoric or the fake uh, nationalist uh, you know, um, rhetoric of, of freeing the country. freeing the country when right. really she was just being recruited. You know, you don't want to be a sex slave anymore. Fine, come join the rebel forces and help us make more sex slaves. Right. Yeah. You know, exactly. That's you know. So it's, again, we have to you know, and this is one of the things, and we should probably end soon on this, mm -hmm. um, unless you have more to say. No. But one of the things that you know, I want to back. I want to back up a little bit. I've been hypercritical of Bernie Sanders because of his inability to call out the electoral fraud and and the lack of um, you know and the voter suppression and, and the lack of the, um, the, the the questionable exit polls you know that's happened all across the country in the primaries. He hasn't spoken out about that. In fact when he had his own lawyer come to him and say look you need to look into this he he ignored it. He acted as if it was you know, so I, I immediately pulled back from him and I became hypercritical of him um, and felt myself going more and more towards an independent status or the Green Party status because I felt that their, their value system was more along the lines of mine, mm -hmm. um, where you value mm -hmm. life over profit right. and life over a popularity contest. Um, but one thing that he has been doing, and I do want to give him credit for this, is he's taking his... Uh, even though it's a very toothless role, it has no power. The fact is, is he does have influence in this country. I he mean, has a lot of influence in this so country. So he's out in front of the camera all the time. Yeah. Uh, and he's going to town hall meetings. And he's going to the areas of the country that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party uh, elites would never, ever step foot in. Mm -hmm. He went into the poorest 
community in our country, in West Virginia, and he sat down and he spoke with those people face to face. And who knows, maybe it was a publicity stunt, maybe, you know, you know, the, the cynic in me is like, well, it's probably just for, you Well, know. He's, he's hawking the, the, the DNC um, party right. line, which is unfortunate because it, he, you know, and I, I know that, that either he's being forced to do this out of threat or he's been convinced out of uh, you know money. He's been brainwashed to, a little bit, yeah. maybe like most of the. And, um, and why, most of what America his commitment is, to the to the Democratic yeah. Party is, I have no idea. But because he's supposed to be an independent. He's an independent. Yeah, so well, he's an independent. He so, so why is that? The right. Democratic Party. Yeah. So the point. But is, he is going to these places. He is going. Whereas to these he could places. be even better than he is good. Right. So he's going to these places, and he's going to Trump territory. He's going to people, and he's asking them, "Why did you vote for Trump? Do you realize that you know forty million people are going to be left without insurance?" And we have 30,000 deaths a year because of people who can't get to a doctor to diagnose terminal illnesses that they might have. Um, and do you realize that that number will increase under, you know, under the Republican program? So even though he may not be saying it out loud and obviously that we need a single payer system, I think that that is sort of the end result of him going out. And, and he's really proving the point that the, the country can come together and that we can learn about what's, what's, you know, what's in the mind of those that have been programmed to believe that they need a gun so that no one will fuck with them and why that entire audience of 1,300 students erupted in applause and shouting and they brought the house down when that one single statement was made. Mm -hmm. I, need, I need, as someone who is completely, you know, disconnected from that reality, I need to, to understand that reality on a level that might make me feel a little bit uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I think that so, we, we, you and I, come from the same... Uh, uh, privilege, um, place of privilege that the kids in the second day um, have. Right, sort of these, you know, middle class... Even though we don't um, feel like we are we come from a place of privilege, we have that Compared privilege. to our friends who have, you know, millions of dollars... <laughs> or and, whatever, uh, and, yeah. And, you know, got the best education, you know, I never had that opportunity. I was one of those, you know, white kids that fell sort of in between the, the mm -hmm. cracks. No, like, your too. parents make too much money, so you... And yet... I had no money, and I had no way of paying for, you know, mm -hmm. an education. You know what I'm saying? So I wasn't privileged, but I was more privileged than, you know, people who are sure. who are starving, yeah. you know. And I, so, I think I want to do a, a podcast on, on privilege alone soon. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, to but just let define me, it. Yeah. Let, me, let me wrap this up, or let me say my last point, and then we can wrap this up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, coming together... So in the terms of, of, you know, they're trying to break us apart, let's come together. I think that there's two groups that have, or two people, um, one group, one person. Ralph Nader has been working for a long time going to the opposite side of the political spectrum to see where common ground can be found. And he's been doing this long before this last election cycle. And it's just you don't hear about it because the media hates Ralph Nader. Right. <laughs> um, and, but he's been working with you know, people from the other side of the political spectrum to try to come together, find uh, um, commonality, and find a place to, to meet, uh, to, to all agree to something, to move forward. So look to him uh, as, a, as, a, as a good leader. I don't think that he would make a great president. I don't think he's going to run anymore either. But this, that said, he has a great new book that um, I'm going to get. I haven't read it yet, but from what I understand, it's, it's pretty awesome. And I think I want to go through points in it in a, in a future mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of yeah. The other thing is, 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 is the Green Party uh, has been working with other um, progressive parties, and they've also been working out in the community. So these criticisms that come from the media that say, oh, you know, the, the Green Party only shows up at the last five minutes right before an election. Well, no, that's, that's not, not true. true. Yeah. They actually go out into communities, and they work with the communities to, to try to come up with a, you know, um, a better way to, to move forward. So, you know, Ralph isn't necessarily affiliated with the Green Party, even though there's some, you know, that he has in the past. These two entities, uh, you need to pay attention to them and, and support them. And if you're not so much a Green, that's fine. You know, there's social um, action. Right. There's the Socialist Democrats. You know, there's other progressives. And, and I think the, the way forward, people are looking for direction. Don't look for a leader. You become the leader or right. you contribute and, and, right. and come together with these other people. So 
Well, the one, uh, and then we'll end this, okay. <laughs> the, how this ties into, because, you know, the podcast here is called Eclipsed, how this ties into the play with what JP just said is the, the, the way that these camps were finally broken up and, they've, and the, the warring factions, the civil warring factions within Liberia finally put their guns down and stopped the bloodshed and, and the, the horrific uh, the assault fighting, yeah. on yeah. their own people right. um, was the women's mm-hmm. movement. Yeah, I didn't write down so, that name, but it was the, um, the African Women um, Society or, uh, uh, Convention for Peace or something like that. And they all wore white. They and they white. and they marched from I think Ivory Coast or somewhere uh, from one place to another within within Liberia. Um, and they were able to go into these camps and into these compounds where these girls were held and explain to them, you know, what was really happening and educate them on what, what the civil war that was brought about as a result of the larger you know issues. Well, yeah, and and so. So, and talk with the warlords too. And they talked with the warlords, and you know the self-appointed warlords, you know. And they, and so what JP said about how there are different uh, factions here in the United States. There's the Green Party. There's the the Socialist Democrats. There's uh, Socialist Alternative, which is the Socialist Alternative was uh, the party that was able to convince. Uh, Seattle to to go, 15. go for fifteen dollars an hour. Mm-hmm. So that's now. a powerful move <laughs> right now. So yeah. we don't even have that in San Francisco. Yeah. So that's a, a powerful movement. Mm-hmm. So you know, and I think I wanted to talk a bit, a little bit about the our our role at the theater that we work at. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and stop okay. this here because okay. I think that it's important to know that how this ties into the play, which is what JP just talked about, is you know. They had their movements. We have ours. They can uh, really make a difference, you know. So we just they brought all of these different squabbling the the women the women women yeah. in Liberia brought all these different squabbling factions brought them together, mm-hmm. and then they were able to you know when you're together you have more power. Mm-hmm. So remember that the deep state and the um, oligarchs that run this country and place the figureheads like Trump like Nancy Pelosi, uh, like Chuck Schumer, like Paul Ryan, place them out in front and they parrot what the deep state wants. That's to keep us squabbling within within the citizenry. If we can ignore that, ignore what they say, focus on what is absolutely necessary, just the basics, then and we then we have the power. So okay. that's what I, I agree. that's what I want to say. <laughs> and in our in our country uh, similar to the women who were dressed in white, you know, that, who brought about peace, Code Pink. So here's a shout out to Code Pink. Code Pink, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so look check up them Code, out. Code Pink. Yeah, we'll as put well. that in our in our comments. Medea Benjamin. And, yeah. yeah, awesome. Okay, anything else? Um, that's it. Okay. Oh, one last thing. The women in white made the the warlords. They made them nervous. They did. And and peace can bring about change because people don't know what to do with it. Right. So that's another thing. Is one thing that I've mentioned over and over and over again in many of my podcasts. The only way that you can get the you know the deep state to to feel uncomfortable is to make them afraid of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So black block aside, that's how we are. That's where we yeah. are. So uh, this has been another live uh, podcast from uh, Facebook Live from uh, Book of Hours. I'm JP Collins, and I'm Julie. And uh, please comment, please uh, like us and join us and go to our YouTube channel, go to our website, book-of-hours.com. Support us, please. We can use the bucks. And uh, anything else? That's it. Trolls will be ignored. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks.